Aren't you thankful for God's daily sufficient grace? Yes. Amen. I appreciate that song. What a beautiful song. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning and turn with me. <clears throat> Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse number 2, I want to notice this morning is our text verse. Jeremiah 31, verse number 2. Notice there. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you and praise you. Lord, I thank you for your daily sustaining grace. And Lord, we can't possibly repay what you've done for us. Lord, how you've blessed us. Lord, how you've forgiven us. Yet, Lord, you want us to obey you. Lord, I pray that we would desire to be obedient to you. And Lord, I pray that this message today would be an encouragement to us. Lord, this, this message is a message that you've laid in my heart. And Lord, I, I don't know all the reasons why, but Lord, you know exactly. And I know that each person here today needed this message, Lord. I pray that we would listen intently. Lord, I pray that we would bow our knee to you as our Lord. Lord, I pray that we would listen intently. Lord, speak to our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this month is Lordship Month, and we've been talking this theme this year is to bow the knee. Bow our knee before the Lord. And the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about bowing our knee to the Lord and bowing to Him as our Lord and our Savior. Not just as our Savior, but as our Lord a couple of weeks and spoke of that. And last week, a gave the challenge from God's word of returning to Bethel. There had been a time and a place in your life when you were closer to the Lord and, and you found yourself, maybe as Abraham did in Egypt, and falling away from God's will and plan and way for your life. And the challenge was for us to bow the knee and go back to that place of the altar and once again give our life back to the Lord and get back to the place where we were serving Him as we once did and surrendered to Him as we once were. This morning, the message that God has for us is a message of, of finding grace in the wilderness. You say, how does that have anything to do with bowing the knee? You know, there are times in our life when we carry such a great burden, the last place often that we turn is to the Lord as we should. We carry that burden. We just continually carry that burden and carry that burden. We get so weighed down with that. And as a result of it, we're not able to do the things that God wants us to do. We're not able to serve as maybe we once did. And you might have gotten weary in well-doing and you feel like you're carrying that burden, that carrying that weight. There's something that is, is God has allowed to come into your life. You feel so heavy with that. It's like you're carrying that weight on your back. And what you need to do today is to bow down before the Lord and find His grace is sufficient for you in this time. God has a grace for us to supply our needs and to take care of our daily problems that we face. And you know, as we think of the, the grace that is sufficient for us, I think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, he understood what it meant to go through a difficult time. He understood what it meant to go through great trial of affliction and great difficulty and having great turmoil in his life and to be under great persecution. The Apostle Paul understood what it meant to lose somebody that he loved. He understood what it meant to go through great hardships and during difficulty and the trying time in the Apostle Paul's life. The word that he received from God was this. My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. You know, many of you, like the Apostle Paul, you have found that God's grace is sufficient. You have seen it to be true over and over and over again. You know, I'm thankful that there is a saving grace I praise God for the grace of God that saved my soul. I'm thankful for by grace that you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I praise God for God's saving grace. But you know what? I'm also thankful that God has a sustaining grace for those who are broken by sorrow. I'm thankful that God gives us the grace to go through those difficulties of life. 
As the songwriter said, there is grace for every need. And I remind you today that in all things and at all times, God's grace is sufficient for us. Do you believe that today? God's grace is sufficient. I love the statement that's found in our text. I want you to notice there once again. Notice the, the Bible says there, found grace in the wilderness. Found grace in the wilderness. Like those in our text here, many of you, you have found grace in the wilderness of life. You found that in the wilderness experiences of life, there was grace to be found to strengthen you, grace to be found to comfort you, grace even to guide you during that difficult time in your life. You know, sitting in the waiting room of an intensive care unit, maybe you found that, that grace that God had for you. Sitting there as you watched a loved one die of cancer, you found that God's grace was there for you. I've seen it. I've been, I've been in that room watching that loved one, that literally there in their last moments of life, taking their last breath, and to feel the grace of God in that place, to see the, the peace of God that passes all understanding and, and the family that's there and how that they trust in God and to be able to sing hymns of praise to God at such a moment as that and to be able to open up God's word and to find God's grace and God to give the strength and to, to be able to see that in a person's life. I've seen it. It's real. Many of you, you've been in that situation. Maybe you're lying awake at night in an empty house. You found grace in the wilderness, feeling lonely, and let you found grace in that wilderness. Maybe when the doctor walked into the room with the solemn look on his face, you found grace in the wilderness. Maybe when your health took, uh, took flight, leaving you with, with the, to battle pain and sickness each day of your life, you found grace in the wilderness. You know, with each treatment, maybe you found grace in the wilderness. You've been through that situation. Whatever it might be, as a child of God, you've seen in times past how that God has been there to give you grace in that wilderness experience of your life. Listen, there is grace to be found in the wilderness. I want to look at this text here this morning. I want to ask that you join with me as we look at this text and consider this wonderful statement made by the prophet Jeremiah. First of all, notice with me today, number one, the difficult place. The difficult place. I want to begin by underscoring the word wilderness. Look there. Look at the word there, wilderness. That word, it speaks of a desert. When I think of a desert, several conditions, they come to my mind. First of all, I think of a desolate condition or desolate conditions. I think of a dry environment. I think of a, an environment that, that, that there's an area that, where there's rain that is limited and it's, it's scarce. There's not much to drink. It's very dry. I think of a place where all you see is sand. All you see is barren landscapes. No beautiful trees. No uh, grass that's growing next to the water and a beautiful place to lay down there. There's no bubbling streams of refreshing springs to drink from. Everywhere you look, it's desolate. You know, life can sometimes be like a wilderness. You ever been there? You ever been in a place where it felt as though that, man, it hasn't rained in some time? It feels desolate. It feels dry. It feels like you're going through a very dry condition. You know, our spiritual lives can seem like a wilderness. They can seem at times barren and desolate. There are times when the showers of blessings are flowing and it seems like they're flowing day after day and things are going great. But listen, there are also those times when it seems that heaven has shut its doors. We cry out to the Lord, but it seems like He's nowhere to be found. We seek His face, but it seems like He's nowhere to be found. He's hid Himself from us. As Job cried out, he says, Wherefore didst thou... Uh, hits, hits thou, thou thy face. Wherefore, hits thou thy face. Lord, why did you hide yourself from me as he cries out? You know, the psalmist, in a similar fashion, he looked up to God and he asked, he said, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hiddest thou thy face from me? Yes, there are those dry and desolate times in our life. Let me call them wilderness experiences of our life. Furthermore, we, we think of the wilderness, when we think of it, I think of despairing conditions. Despairing. Not just desolate, but despairing. 
You know, many a lost soul or traveler has found the wilderness or desert to be the worst of worst environments. There's the burning sun by day that shines down and it's so hot, it's so dry, and it's so bitter cold by night. There's a lack of water. There's a lack of food. Terrible place to be. You know, there's many a bleached bone that attests of a silent testimony of the environment of the desert. You know, and sometimes the wilderness experiences of life can bring us to a place of feeling helpless and hopeless. There are times we feel as though it's so dry. There are times when we experience literally a situation that literally stretches our faith. Literally, it feels like to the limits. There are other experiences that push us literally to the brink of despair in our life. And we find ourselves feeling that we can't handle another day. We can't push on for another hour. Have we all not felt like David felt in Psalm 102, verse 6, when he said, I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. Huh. By the way, they wouldn't be very happy in those places. Can you picture it? David was so desolate, he was like a mournful looking owl or a, a bird sitting alone there, not being able to get to the water. His strength was gone. He was inwardly depressed. He had lost his will to live. We're talking about David here. We're talking about a man after God's own heart. We're talking about a man that God used in a great way. We're talking about a man that in his life, he faced Goliath and won. We're talking about a man that had great triumphs in his life. We're talking about a man that had great victories in his life. And here he is now. He's in a desert place. Yes, the wilderness is a difficult place to be found in. Yet as we look at our text, we see that these who found themselves here in such a place, I want you to notice not only they were in a difficult place, but secondly, it, it, notice briefly with me, it says a word about a distressed people. A distressed people. Look there at our text, underscore the words from our text, the people of Israel. The people, even Israel. Jeremiah speaks of those who found themselves in such a difficult place. Distressful. Depressing times they find themselves in. Here they are. I want you to notice their distress as described by our text. First of all, notice the distressing calamity behind them. What had happened to them? We read in verse number 2, it says, For those which were left of the sword. Those that were left of the sword. Jeremiah was no doubt speaking of the Assyrians, how they had come in and devastated them, how they had brought great destruction to the nation of Israel. Our text, it indicates that many died by the sword of the Assyrians. City after city had been captured, had been conquered. Blood had run literally down the streets of those cities. Devastation, destruction had come in their wake. You know, like any war-torn country, you can paint an image of what it must have been like. In our mind, the calamity that the people had experienced, what they had gone through. They had been ripped from their homes, fleeing literally for their very lives, many of them dying by the sword. One can understand the distressful condition they were experiencing. Yet their distress is not limited to the calamity, the enemy's sword. Uh, but we also see in the text, we see the distressing conditions before them. Not just what was behind them, but what they were facing even now. Our text, it seems to indicate that those who managed to escape, they were forced to flee into the wilderness or desert. They had not only had to flee for their very lives, but now they found themselves in a desert having to fight for their lives. Those that were left by the sword only found that they had another battle to fight. I mean, it wasn't just one battle. How they have another battle. A battle with a, a hostile environment, the wilderness they face. Once again, I want to remind you today that life can be a wilderness experience. Life can be difficult. Like the people of our text, we find ourselves oftentimes encountering distressful situations, difficult situations. Like them, we find ourselves facing literally the, 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 the sword of life. It seems like it comes and it cuts us right to the very heart, and we have to face the burning sand of the wilderness. Yet we see also for the distressed people, they made a wonderful discovery in the wilderness. I think of the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon, wonderful man of God of yesteryear, great preacher, 
one of the greatest preachers, I believe, uh, in, in, the, in the past century. I believe one of the greatest preachers in, that ever preached in England. A great man of God that literally had such power as he, as he spoke that men still read his messages today and hearts are still changed. His ministry is still touching lives today. It's had an impact on my life as I read his writings. A great man of God. great and powerful man of God. A man that experienced great blessings in his life. And yet his ministry, even though it was being significantly blessed by God, people by the scores were being saved. People were coming by the thousands to hear him preach. As a matter of fact, the chapel where Spurgeon preached, it was packed with people. The halls, the passages, I mean every room that was inside that building was being packed by people. More than 3,000 were packed into a building that sat, that sat 1,500. Can you imagine? I mean they were packed wall to wall inside that building. And for a while, they, they rented out the uh, Exeter Hall uh, for Sunday nights to try to add more room. But it wasn't long. That was too small. And they moved on to the, the Surrey Music Hall, London's most commodious and beautiful uh, building that was rented. I mean, it was a beautiful building. They got the biggest building they could possibly get. It sat ten to 12,000 people. I mean, in that day, that was a huge building. ten to 12,000 people. And on one afternoon, it was October the 19th, 1856, the, the opening service in the hall was held. The place was packed. Literally, can you imagine the seating of 10 to 12,000 people? They had that thing packed out. There was an additional 10,000 people that were out in the gardens that were going to listen through the doorway so they could hear the message preached. Can you imagine? Shortly after the service began, though, there was a cry that pierced the air. Fire! fire the galleries are giving way the place is falling can you imagine what ensued people began to scream people began to run hey listen it was not a fire there were some malicious rebels that were out there that wanted to cause problems for the service and but as a result of that the event literally almost literally broke this great preacher, because the event that night caused people to run out. People were injured. People, literally, literally, seven people died as a result of the stampede. It said that Spurgeon fell apart. <clears throat> as one writer stated, he said it almost unseated his reason. It broke him. He had to be carried from the pulpit and was taken to a friend's house where he remained for several days, so depressed he was unable to get out of bed for days. In fact, he never fully recovered. The tragedy constantly bothered him, was inside of him. Depression became a constant battle in his life. Spurgeon himself, he wrote of the tragedy, quote, he said, perhaps never a soul went so near the burning furnace of insanity. Here's a man of God. Here's a man whom I've read his sermons. Powerful. Here's a man of God that he's written many books. You can read them yet today. And yet he says he went through such a time. He, he, he used the words, never a soul went so near the burning furnace of insanity. You know what this tells me? Any one of us could be in that position. Right. Any one of us. He was only 56 years old when he died. A close friend and biographer, he wrote, quote, I cannot but think from what I saw that his comparatively early death might be in some measure due to the, f the, the furnace of mental suffering he endured on and after that fearful night. It was something that was so etched in him that he carried that the rest of his life and his friend believed that it might have been even possible that it was cause of his early death. Listen, there are distressing experiences in life. There are difficulties that we go through. Those wilderness experiences for even the best of God's people and servants. There are times we're going to go through difficult situations in life. We're going to go through great trials of affliction. We're going to go through great difficulties in our life. Life can be comfortable and suddenly adversity comes storming into our life and literally driving us into the wilderness. Even in a time of great blessing, we can find ourselves suddenly thrown into the wilderness. Yet as we look at our text, we find they made a marvelous discovery in the wilderness. I want us to look at that thirdly. Notice lastly with me the, the delightful provision. Our text tells us that they found grace in the wilderness. They found grace in the wilderness. In a place of desolation. In a place of despair. They found that grace from God. They found grace that strengthened and sustained them. 
Well, let me remind you today that God's grace is sufficient and you will find grace in the wilderness. God knows what you're going through. God knows the hardship that you're facing. God's grace is sufficient for you. You can find that grace in the wilderness. Just like those of our text, we can find God's grace in the wilderness. What kind of grace did they find? What did they find? Let's look at it for a moment. They found grace for their weariness, number one. Grace for their weariness. You can only imagine how weary they must have been. I mean, sometimes you just read through verses like this. You go right past You don't think much of it. Dig into it a little bit. You think about what they were really going through. I mean, understand how they must have felt. That word there, left, it speaks of those that survived. They were left. That means they were the ones that made it. They were the survivors. They were the ones that had survived and fled for their lives into the wilderness. Days maybe passed. Possibly those days turned into weeks and those weeks turned into months. Can you imagine how physically and mentally, emotionally weary those people must have been? Yet they found grace in the wilderness. Let me ask you today, are you weary from the wilderness? Are you going through a difficult time? Has the burdens and cares of life worn you down physically, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually? Are you going through that time? Do you find yourself feeling helpless and hopeless? Are you tired of the battles? Are you tired of the burdens of life? Hey, listen, there's grace in the wilderness for you. God's grace is sufficient. I love the hymns. I love looking at hymns. I love looking at stories of how hymns were written. One of the great stories of, of a great hymn. And, and, and your heart truly can be blessed by a hymn that was written by Frank Graff is his name. His song that he, that he wrote, it, his words, they begin like this. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Too deeply for mirth and song. As the burdens press and the cares distress. And the way goes weary. And long, thoughtful words. You say, well, where these words come from? Well, you look at the story of how he wrote this. It's an amazing thing. Frank Graff, he was a minister who found himself literally in deep depression. At a very low point in his life, and literally in the wilderness of his life. And he was later to say that his, quote, whole attitude had become one of despair and defeat. As his words expressed, the pressing burdens and distressing cares had made the way weary and long. It felt like it would never end. Each day that passed, he found himself slipping deeper and deeper into depression until one day he felt that he could not stand it any longer. He could not do it. He came to the end of his road. He was as low as he could go. He was in the darkest hour of his life. And as he was there, he began to sing a song that God had laid on his heart, a song that was written 75 years earlier by Joseph Scriven. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. He couldn't keep singing that song. As God began to overwhelm him with his love, this preacher got down on his knees and he began to shout as God filled his heart with peace. He began to shout out to God, I know that he cares. I know my Savior cares. Listen, can I sum it up for you this morning? What happened here to Frank, this preacher? He, what did he, listen, he found grace in the wilderness. He found in the way that goes, grows weary. And he found in that way that goes long. It seems as though it seems it'll never end. He found this. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. He wrote these words. He saw it for real in his life. It was something that he experienced that God does care. Yes, there is grace for our weariness in the wilderness. Furthermore, they found grace for their fearfulness, for their fearfulness. I can only imagine how weary they were. It's, you know, if you think about what they were going through and how weary it must have been, but I also, I can imagine how fearful they must have been. You think about it. 
would the Assyrian army find us? I mean, are they going to come out after us? Are we going to be, uh, I mean, chopped down with a sword as well? Are they going to come after me? Would, would I survive the desert that we're in? Are we going to make it? I mean, we have nothing to drink. What are we going to do? How, how fear must have gripped their hearts. Can you imagine what they were going through? Let me ask you today. Have you found yourself in the wilderness and so doing found your heart filled with fear? Are you there today? Is there fear of what the doctor maybe is going to say? Is there fear about the, the, the treatment that you're going to have to go through? Is there fear whether you're going to keep your job? Is there fear whether you're going to be able to pay your bills? I mean, is there fear that you're facing today? If so, listen, I want to again remind you that there is grace to be found in the wilderness. God's not forgotten about you. God knows all about your situation. God knows what you're going through. God wants to help you. God wants to give his sustaining grace to you. You know, the great hymn writer, Sir Isaac Watts, he wrote a hymn entitled, My God, How Many Are My Fears? Sounds like a good hymn. I, I know the name. I, I looked it up. But you know what? I've never sang that hymn. But it sounds like a song that, hey, oftentimes, God, I have so many fears. But, you know, I'm thankful. I think of another song written, written uh, by another writer, uh, John Newton, in those great words of amazing grace that say this, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." I'm thankful. That, hey, listen, there's going to be fears in life we're going to face. There's going to be trials that we're going to go through. But God's grace is sufficient. God will give us grace in the wilderness. God will give us what we need. And I'll tell you what, it's by God's grace that we can have our fears relieved. There is grace to relieve them. The psalmist said this in Psalm 56, verse 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Hey, here's a man that understood something. He had seen it over and over again that God is trustworthy. You can mark it down. You can trust in God. God hasn't forgotten about you. God knows what you're going through. God knows what trials that you're facing. God knows what sickness that maybe you're going through. God knows that heartache that you have. God knows the brokenness in your life. God knows the dryness of your life. God knows what you're going through. And what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Hey, listen, I know he's trustworthy. I've seen it over and over again in my life that, hey, listen, I can trust in him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. You can trust in him. You can trust in him. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. You see, we can trust in him at all times through all the situations of life. Furthermore, they found grace in the wilderness for their emptiness. For their emptiness. As our text states, these that are in the wilderness are those that are left of the sword. They were the ones that were the survivors. They were the ones that, that, that had gotten a, a, a free and had gotten away. But you know what? There were those that didn't survive. There were those that had died of the sword. No doubt, those that had died had been a brother or a sister, a mom or a dad. Can you picture it? A grandpa or a grandma. You think about what they were going through. You think about this, the emptiness that they had. Somebody was missing. Somebody was gone. Somebody they love. It might have been a child. It might have been their mama. Hey, listen, somebody was gone. They had uh, emptiness inside their heart. Hey, they were in the wilderness. They had distress caused by the conditions around them. But there was also the grief and sorrow they carried on the inside. Emptiness. You know, many of you know what that's like. The death of someone that you love. That void. That emptiness in your heart. You miss them. It might be the empty house, the empty chair, the empty table. But that emptiness, it manifests itself in deep sorrow in your heart. Yet for those who had seen their loved ones slaughtered and had been forced to leave their bodies behind, they found grace in the wilderness. These folks, they found that grace. They found that God's grace was with them in the wilderness. Hey, listen, when the doctor walks out and he says, I did all that I could do, God will give his grace. When we have to go to the funeral home and make arrangements, hey, listen, there is God 
God is there. God will give grace even in that time. Hey, when we have to leave the cemetery, there will be the grace of God for us. When we have to go back home without a loved one, hey, listen, there is grace to be found in the wilderness. I love the old song, God will take care of you. It's a great song. That song was written by Dr. William uh, Stillman Martin. The story behind how he wrote that song was it was a Sunday morning. He was getting ready to go preach, and he was a special speaker that day. And as he got up and he got up to, to get ready and whatnot, he found out that his wife was really sick. I mean, she was running a high fever. Well, Dr. Martin, he was worried about her, and he said that he could cancel his engagement and stay home with her. And, honey, I'll stay, he said. And yet before she could answer him, their seven-year-old daughter spoke up and said this. Oh, Daddy, you don't have to stay home because of Mother. God will take care of us. You know what? Dr. Martin did go on and preach, and later he wrote his great hymn. And I remind you this morning, listen, you, if you are in the wilderness, listen to these words. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Hey, listen. God loves you. God loves you more than you can possibly comprehend it. We can't even comprehend how much God loves us. He's not going to leave us alone. God knows what we're going through. God will give us grace to get through what we're going through. God will give us grace that is sufficient. Hey, listen, if he was able to do it for the Apostle Paul, he'll be able to do it for me. If he was able to do it for these children of Israel, he'll be able to do it for us. If God was able to do it for my mom and dad, God will do it for me. If God has been able to do it in my life over and over again, I'm here to attest to you today. I can say with firsthand knowledge and experience, God will do it for you as well. God will give us grace to go through that wilderness of life, those difficulties of life, and oftentimes how sad it is. God is there wanting to give us the grace. God wants to give us the peace that passes all understanding. God wants us to give us the ability to get through that difficult situation in the storms of life. God wants to carry us through that. And oftentimes, what do we do? We allow ourselves to try to carry it alone. Listen, stop carrying that burden alone. Bow the knee. Lay that burden at the feet of, Christ, of the cross. Give that burden to Christ. You might not have all that thing that you're going through removed. I'll tell you what, <clears throat> the storms of life, they rage at times. But listen, the storm might not stop. But I'll tell you what, we can have Jesus Christ with us and have peace through that storm. We can have the peace that passes all understanding. God will give us grace for the wilderness of life. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Lord, we're so thankful that you love us. Lord, you'll never leave us. Lord, you're our Heavenly Father. You love us more than we can comprehend. Lord, by your divine wisdom and knowledge, there are times you allow us to go through difficulties in life. Lord, it might be as a result of this curse of sin on this world what sin brings, it might also be as a result of you allowing it to happen to mold us and make us. And Lord, we know that you are in control. You are God. Nothing takes you by surprise. And Lord, I pray that we would just come to you today, Lord, that we might get grace in the wilderness. Lord, we know it can be found. You've promised us that. Lord, I pray for those that are struggling, that are hurting today. Lord, I pray you'd encourage them. Lord, I pray that they would lay that at your feet, trust in you. Lord, they would come boldly before your throne, that they might find mercy and grace in time of need. Lord, give us your peace today. Speak to our hearts. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, let me ask you, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Have you been born again? You know for sure 100% that you're on your way to heaven based on the promise of God's word. If that's your testimony today, would you lift your hand up high and say, yes, I know I'm saved. I have no doubt. I know I'm saved. God bless you. May put your hands down. Maybe you weren't able to raise your hand. You don't know 100% that you're on your way to heaven. I'm here to tell you today that God loves you. God wants you to have that peace of knowing for sure 
God doesn't want you to leave today without having the absolute assurance of knowing that you're on your way to heaven. Maybe you're here this morning and you just be honest. See, the first step of getting to the place of knowing that you're going to heaven is to acknowledge the fact that you don't know. First place you must go. Acknowledge the fact that you don't know. Would you be honest today? Say, preacher, I'm being honest. I don't know for 100% sure that if I die, that I go to heaven. I don't know for sure. Would you lift your hand up? I want to pray for you. I'm not going to, I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you, but I will pray for you. Would you just put your hand up real quick and then put it back down? Anybody like that this morning? Say, I don't know for sure. Christian, if you're not going through the wilderness right now, one day you will. How are you handling that? Maybe today what you need to do is just bow the knee. Whatever that is, that's that burden that you're carrying, that dry place that you're in. It might not be that you feel like you're at the end, but hey, listen, don't wait till you get to the end to come to the Lord. Ask God for his sustaining grace. Lay that at his feet and trust in him. You might be in a situation in your life when you can't move any further. Let God carry you. You lay yourself right down before him and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, listen, he'll hear your prayer. You need God's grace today. I want to invite you to come. Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd bring peace. On bended knee, Lord, I pray we would come before you today. Lay that burden at your feet. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Each person here today is going through different circumstances of life. The constant is you. You never change. You are immutable. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, you are trustworthy. Oh, Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for being our God and our Father, our Lord and our Savior, the one that sustains, the one that gives rest, the one that gives peace, comfort. Lord, I'm thankful that nothing will ever separate us from your love. Nothing could ever change that. Lord, speak to hearts.